definitely I feel that the younger generation is more aware nowadays and all the problems that we have related to climate change and pollution are raising awareness. Uh, however, we will not get there without the role of policies and regulations and industries and companies starting to do things differently. Maya Karkour, أهلا وسهلا فيك بالموسم الثاني من برنامج Energy Espresso. البودكاست من إنتاج ال UNDP وبدعم الاتحاد الأوروبي اللي بيعالج مواضيع الطاقة المتجددة وبيحاول يقدم الحلول المستدامة للتحديات البيئية الاقتصادية والاجتماعية اللي بيعاني منها لبنان. وما تنسوا تابعونا على كل مواقع التواصل الاجتماعي وعلى يوتيوب وأكيد سبسكريبشن تعنينا كتير اليوم حلقتنا رح تكون عن موضوع الاقتصاد الدائري أو ما يسمى بالإنجليزي بالسيركولر إيكونومي وعلاقة السيركولر إيكونومي بالطاقات المستدامة بشان هيك بيسعدنا كتير اليوم انه نستضيف مايا كاركور وهي متخصصة بالاقتصاد الدائري واختصاصية بيئية ومؤسسة سيركولر هاب وإيكو كونسالتينج الحلقة اليوم رح تكون باللغة الإنجليزية So tell us a bit more about yourself and what took you to the circular economy field هاي لوري اول شيء كثير مبسوطه اكون هون معكم سادي رح احكي بال بالانجليزي بس حتى اوصل المساجات شوي احسن لانه عايشه نص حياتي برات لبنان بقى في كلمات بضيع شويه فيها So um, I'm an environmental consultant. Uh, I have also been specializing in the topic of the circular economy since uh, eight years now. Like you mentioned, I'm the founder of Eco Consulting. It's an environmental and sustainability consultancy. One of its key pillars is green buildings, eco-friendly buildings, offering advice on that. And we also work in climate change, uh, uh, environmental education, environmental awareness, topics related to the environmental field. And a few years ago, we um, created the Circular Hub, which I will be talking about a little later. Uh, we refurbished our office to create a space that brings together people to learn more about these topics, the environment, climate change, sustainability, and the circular economy. So let's start with basics. So what is circular economy and why is it so important for society? Okay, Laurie, so I'm going to start by asking a simple question. Where do all uh, the objects, the products, the food, uh, the, the drinks that we drink come from? Where, if you think about it, all these laptops, the smartphones that are essential today for our daily lives, but even the stable, the chair we're sitting on, where do the materials come from? Obviously, it's a very simple question, but the majority of us uh, have forgotten that everything is actually coming from this planet Earth, and currently we only have one planet Earth on which we can live and survive and sustain. So, um, how do we get all these materials? Either by extracting from forests, through agriculture and the soil that is in principle rich and allows us to plant the food and the vegetables and the fruits that we need. We also uh, quarry to extract stone, we extract uh, natural resources, we fish, we hunt, everything comes from nature, from planet Earth. The main problem today though is that we humans um, uh, have forgotten about this close link with nature, but also we have the tendency to think that nature is abundant. There are unlimited resources. They are renewable, they reproduce, they are regenerative, and thus we can extract and use as much as we want. But this is the main root of our current environmental problems. We can't continue doing this because we're actually destroying. We are not allowing uh, the, the, the essence, the equilibrium of nature to stay and to regenerate. And so this started happening uh, more and more since the discovery of oil, of fossil fuel and the industrial revolution, which allowed us, of course, to uh, modernize, to create all these new smart and innovative technologies that we depend on that are awesome for our you know, modern way of living. But um, the recognition today is that we are operating in what we call a linear economy, which is the contrary of what I will be talking mm -hmm. about, the circular economy. So it's a linear economy. It's also called take, make, waste, 
What does this mean? It means that if we think about our industries, our companies, we're actually extracting raw materials and resources from the earth. We are processing, manufacturing, using a lot of energy along the way to do so, producing, selling, it goes to the end user, and then once we don't want an object or we don't need it anymore, what happens to it? We just throw it away. We just throw it away. It goes to waste. The waste management problem is a worldwide issue. It's not just here. Mm -hmm. We see it more here, but it's not just here. So we, we're producing a lot of waste. And on the other hand, we have another problem, which is these raw materials, these resources, they are actually dwindling. They, we are over-extracting. We are overusing, And even things like rare earths, uh, metals, and uh, elements, that are essential, for, in, for instance, in our smartphones and our laptops, we're extracting and extracting, and they are not infinite. They took billions yeah. of years to form, or they are in the crust of the Earth, so they don't regenerate. So these are precious metals and materials that we are using once and then throwing again mm -hmm. to the landfill. Can you tell me what is circular economy? And uh, what, uh, why is it so, uh, I understand kind of why it is so important now, but what is it exactly, if we want to define it like in a couple of words for people to understand? Yes, exactly. So basically it's the opposite of a linear economy. So I mentioned it's take, waste, uh, take, make and waste. What we want to do is actually recirculate. Instead of wasting, how do we value this waste as something valuable? Think about gold. Yeah. Would you throw gold in the bin? Would you throw it in the bin? You wouldn't throw a ring made of gold in the bin. It's very, very valuable. So we need to start thinking today that actually every resource that is available to us on this planet, especially that you know, we have uh, a population that is growing, that requires more and more resources, every single resource that is available to us should be viewed a bit like gold in the sense that why do we toss it in the bin? No, we need to recirculate it into the economy. We need to take it back and make a reuse of it. So my other question is, uh, because this is a podcast that talks about like sustainable uh, solutions and about energy. So what is the relation between circular economy and energy or sustainable solutions or sustainable, sustainable energies? Okay, so to explain a little more first the circular economy, yeah. basically what this means is that in our industries, in our companies, in the way we function, we should find ways so that leftovers and waste are actually taken back and reintroduced back into the economic or industrial cycle. Let me give a very simple example, our clothes, okay? We, we don't always want to keep our clothes indefinitely. Sometimes, you know, for, for babies, they grow, so the clothes is not uh, needed anymore. Uh, it's out of fashion. There are many reasons why we don't want anymore our, our clothes. So instead of it going to the bin or to landfill, we want to figure out mechanism uh, in our society for these uh, textiles and clothing to be recirculated. That means it could be secondhand shops, it could be vintage shops, it could be that it's donated to the right people, etc. So the idea of recirculation also is very linked to the usage of energy. Why? Um, to, in order to extract, we tend to forget that to extract all of these materials, so for instance, Again, the example of the clothes, the yep. t-shirt, a cotton t-shirt. You do need agriculture, you need to print the cotton, that means you also need energy along the way. If you are uh, producing synthetic clothing that comes from fossil fuel, you need to extract fossil fuel. All of this is what we call uh, embodied energy of extraction. So this energy uh, is considerable when you are using raw virgin raw materials or when you are using extracting for the first time from the crust of the earth or mining. While if we are reusing in principles such as uh, re repairing, maintaining, refurbishing, renovating, already a big chunk of this energy that would have been needed from virgin raw materials is reduced considerably. So this is one of the main links. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's very important, but go ahead, go ahead. Yes, I wanted to add also once one principle of the circular economy is that we also try to work as much as possible locally or regionally, meaning that you want to recirculate locally. You don't want to take this waste and ship it to China. So you want to get a good value or reproduce something out of it. And that also means that you are reducing your energy from transportation because you're empowering more local uh, production and consumption. So how important it is for society to be aware of and how this is going to be a fact and 
and our planet as well. Yes, exactly. So one, for instance, one of the principles of a circular economy is what we call a sharing economy. How can we, instead of owning all of these products that we have, share them with other people, especially products, equipment and appliances that we use once a month or once a year? Think about, I don't know, gardening tool, let's say. So uh, the sharing economy means, again, for transportation. Public, uh, public transportation is the first example of a sharing economy where instead of owning your own car, you're actually sharing the transport and mobility with other people. So that is a very important principle too. Uh, there are many different ways in terms of what you uh, mentioned for the uh, batteries of the electric cars. This is a huge issue that is going to happen in the future. We, if we decarbonize and switch towards electric cars, what do we do with all these batteries? So we need to find effective ways to actually disassemble all of these batteries, remove all the important uh, metals and minerals and plastic, everything that is in it, and be able to either create new batteries out of it or redistribute it to other industries. That's very important because again, like we think of when we think about, yes, let's move into renewable energy, uh, it's clean. We forget about all of these. So uh, Maya, I'm uh, very curious to know how can the circular economy affect our everyday life? and the quality of life. You know, we're all complaining about the quality of life, etc., in different aspects. So how can the circular economy save us? Uh, let me first uh, talk about how it will affect our everyday life. So in a concept of a circular economy, as I mentioned, a lot of things are going to be recirculated. What does it mean in practice for people, not companies, but people? That means that everything that you don't need anymore at the end will have to go back to either the manufacturer or the company that produced it, or to another company, or maybe even to an NGO that will donate it. But the idea here is that it does not go to the bin. It does not go to waste. Which means that if we adopt a model of a circular economy, there will be more and more uh, mechanisms and uh, services of recirculation. But how do we incentivize this? So, uh, so of course, we don't want, I mean, we don't feel necessarily comfortable about all the time taking everything and bringing it back to the manufacturer. So there will be in the future services that facilitate this for us. It could be financial incentives. It could be that if you return, let's say, your swimsuit, you get a new swimsuit with a 25% discount, which will in incentivize that you don't throw the old one and you get a financial incentive for it. It could be rewards, points. We have today, for instance, I don't know if you've, learned, uh, you've heard in Lebanon about the Lebanon Waste Management Initiative called the uh, drive throw mm -hmm. where to facilitate recycling, uh, the idea is that you can come with your car and you have sorted all different types of recyclables and through the window you give it to them, they weigh it, and depending on what you have given them, they value these recyclables and they give you money. Uh, that you can either use or you can even donate for other charities. So it's a way to bring economic incentives uh, to the market for people to recirculate their waste instead of throwing it in the bin. So this will be available, but also in models of a sharing economy, like I mentioned, we will have more access to buy and sell platforms where you buy things and you sell, uh, you buy uh, things secondhand mm -hmm. and you sell them when you don't want them. There will be more and more open source technologies, uh, tools, do it yourself, available, explaining exactly how you can repair items, how you can refurbish items so that they don't go to waste. So that means in our everyday life, things will eventually change in terms of getting there. And from the quality of life perspective, if we do that, of course, we're saying we're reducing waste, which means also reducing pollution. We also the waste on our streets and what it causes. So that means uh, less CO2 emissions, less other types of pollutants on the street. Uh, that means also that uh, even the cost of some of these materials will go down because instead of importing it from abroad, we are actually recycling, re recycling yeah. it or recirculating it. So that also will have will increase, let's say, our quality of life in terms of having more affordability, but also security of resources because things are more available locally and you don't need like, remember in the COVID where a lot of things um, were not circulating anymore worldwide. Exactly. So the more local you availability you have, the easier it is to actually have security in terms of resources. Of course, and it's uh, it will cost less, as you said, and financially will be better because the 
our import uh, bill is very high, right? Uh, exactly. In the country. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, so one other, to link it again to energy and renewable projects. So there's a, there are a lot of experts saying that what will happen to the solar panels after they're used and we no longer need them. And there is a big concern about it because from what we're understanding, there are no laws to regulate this issue. Are you as like experts into circular economy looking into these and helping the government or other entities to come, for, with the, to come up with like solutions to these solar panels that will be uh, future waste? Yeah, I mean, personally, no, I'm not working on this. However, definitely at an international level and even at a local level, more and more uh, specialist experts and companies are looking into how to repurpose all of these uh, electric equipments uh, and electronic waste in order to, as I mentioned before, to extract from them all these valuable metals, rare earths, uh, metals and elements, Anything, even plastic, uh, can be re, uh, recycled also and go back to the economy. So, yes, we do have a big issue if we decarbonize and rely on uh, electric batteries in the future for all our transportation. However, uh, by recirculating, by what we call uh, recycling electronic waste, we will be able to get the security of materials that are not abundant, in that abundant, some of them, not that abundant in nature. Okay, perfect. So let's uh, discuss now another concept, which is the energy footprint yes. and, the, and its impact. So first, again, let's uh, uh, go with basics and understand what's the concept. So if you can explain to us what's the concept of this energy uh, footprint, what do we mean by it? Sure. Um, so the energy footprint concept is a bit similar to the carbon footprint concept, which you might heard about, which is about CO2 emissions. Uh, from a specific product. While here we're focusing with the energy footprint on the energy. So how much energy for, let's say, one product uh, has been needed in order to uh, extract it uh, or extract the different materials mm -hmm. that constitute it? Or if it's food, for instance, it could be how much energy has been required in order to grow it, but also for the packaging, for the processing, for the distribution, for the operation of the factory, uh, and the, the facilities and the transportation to the end user. Uh, all of this is the energy that is directly related to getting this product to you. But in the energy footprint calculation, we also take into account what type of energy has been used in order to produce this product. Did we rely on renewable energies or on the contrary, did we use you know, coal plants in order to produce our electricity? Did we burn? Uh, some type of fuel. So each different types of fossil fuels have different energy footprints and carbon emissions, and renewable energy reduces the energy consumption that you need in order to produce. Another element that also sometimes is taken into account in the calculation is energy efficiency. So how much we, we have put in terms of energy efficient measures in the production process. So the efficient lighting, efficient equipment, uh, air conditioning system, and so on and so forth. So it's a complex uh, methodology to, to get to the footprint, but what it does is that it allows us to look at the full life cycle of production of mm -hmm. the product and also to compare two different similar alternatives and see which one has a lower energy footprint. If we take the example of an orange, yep. uh, one coming uh, imported from, I don't know, Ar Argentina, let's say, and one coming from Lebanon, you will immediately see that the energy footprint of transportation is much lower here. But then also we need to take into account other energy elements in it to see which is the best option. Uh, so uh, it's good that you talked about like these choices and very basic choices about like using which orange to buy, because then you're putting a lot of emphasis on the citizen and the awareness of the citizen. Yes. First of all, how can I know about all these information when I'm buying an orange if there are no uh, indications on anywhere about like these oranges or automatically if it's come from far away it means like it has more energy footprint so how can you how can people be more aware of that and what is needed to be done so that we are aware and how that understanding yeah. about energy footprint will influence our choices and how can it be useful in the context of the circular economy as well? It's a complex topic here, and this is developing slowly, but there are uh, resources available. Um, the, the technique is called life cycle assessment, where a specialist look at the, 
the energy footprint of different products and are able to give us benchmarks so we can evaluate. But I mean, from a simple consumer perspective, uh, typically we, we have to also question things. So obviously if they come from far away and they are available locally, and it is the season when they are available locally, uh, no questions asked, we have to use local resources that are available mm -hmm. here. But it's also sometimes, you know, to look at the big picture, you also have to ev evaluate different elements. So are we deforesting in order to get this, uh, this uh, resource that is available locally? So let's say wood. If we are going to the, I don't know, the Baruch forest and deforesting in order to get our wood, it is local, yes, but we're causing a lot of damage to our biodiversity. While we could actually import wood from Germany that uh, comes from a sustainable forest, then maybe the energy impact is higher, but the actual impact on biodiversity, on deforestation, and globally on climate change and, and global warming is lower. So it's, it's a complex topic here, and it's, it requires also specialists behind that are explaining this to the general public and giving, you know, there is something that we call eco-labeling that can also uh, give, or eco-certifications that give more information about this type of, uh, uh, products and how to select the most uh, eco-friendly ones. Uh, my question in this part about energy footprint now, the last one is like, are there any other applications uh, of the energy uh, footprint? Yes, definitely. So let me take the example of uh, construction, okay. architecture. Um, and this is where, you know, there is a really a close interlinkage between uh, energy footprint and the circular economy. So to, to build a house, before building a house, we design it, a new house, let's say. And uh, there are a lot of resources and materials being used throughout the process. But uh, in the concept of a circular economy, we want to minimize the resources, but also we want to minimize the energy that we use. And we want to rely as much as possible on renewable energy. That means that architects, engineers, should actually learn about what we call bioclimatic design or energy efficient design, meaning that the orientation of the building, the size of the windows, the shading, all of this will influence the amount of energy that we need to heat and cool the house. And one very important aspect here is insulation, lazil. So how much are we insulating these buildings. When we go high up in the mountains or at any altitude, we need to insulate to reduce our, to cut drastically actually, our energy consumption, our electricity, uh, our um, heating and cooling yeah. consumption, electricity consumption for air conditioning. So these type of things, they have an energy advantage, but they are also, uh, they go hand in hand with a concept of a circular economy in the sense of using less resources, meaning also less fossil fuel or uh, less energy. So energy efficiency is, is key to a concept of circular eco economy. But on top of that, I can talk about the building materials themselves. So mm -hmm. how do you choose these materials? Um, you can choose concrete, but you can also choose other types of materials that are more uh, natural, biodegradable, that have less um, effect on our health and also on the health of our planet. Uh, let me give a few examples. For insulation today, we have a few startups in Lebanon that, that have started producing insulation coming from waste. Example, there is a company called Grade A Plus that is producing insulation from sheep wool. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the wool of the sheep, yep. uh, working with, uh, with sheep uh, shepherds, basically. And this insulation is locally produced. It is a type of waste that they are burning if they, are, if they don't, if it's not collected for producing this insulation, it would have been burnt because they don't know what to do uh, with it, meaning energy emissions, uh, energy requirements and CO2 emissions. Yeah. But um, that also means you're creating a local, uh, a local uh, production for something that is useful that will cut energy consumption if you are to use it in our houses and buildings. Another company is using textile waste now, uh, Collab Refabrica. They are collaborating now with SCAF, uh, who uh, they are very known for textile in of Lebanon. Course, yeah. So SCAF will be giving them their leftover and the waste that has the faults in it, the textile waste, for them to produce insulation in order to also being used in construction, but locally from leftover waste. So you see how the dots are linking in terms of our waste becomes a resource, a valuable resource, but also it reduces energy in the construction field. 
there are uh, so, many so, linkages. So that's, uh, that's uh, very interesting. So things are happening in Lebanon. Things are happening. Uh, they are happening at, I would say, at a small scale still, okay. but we're hoping that this will grow. There is, uh, let's what say... What do we need mm. to make it grow? Is it just awareness or more than awareness? We or? need a lot of things to make so it tell grow. Me, so <laughs> tell me, so tell me, what do we need in Lebanon? Awareness, definitely. We need awareness. We need environmental education. Uh, we need this to be instilled in schools, universities, public and private, but even technical schools, so that people understand the why behind. It's not just a lecture about saving this, the planet and the environment, but why is this actually a source of revenue for you in the future? It could create new green jobs. It could, there are many new jobs that will be created thanks to a circular economy because we're redesigning the economic model in a different way. So you need more people to recirculate this waste, to perhaps separate it, disassemble it. We also need uh, a lot of awareness in any design school, anyone that is a designer, whether it is a fashion designer, industrial designer, product designer, architect, uh, interior designer, any designers of objects, they have a huge role in a circular economy because the way you design a product from the beginning will influence how uh, toxic and uh, uh, not eco-friendly it will be throughout its whole life. I can give a simple example. If, you, if we're producing an interior designer, it's producing a table, and the varnish on this table contains a lot of toxic chemicals that evaporate when you are in a room that is a bit hot. Mm -hmm. That means that, let's say we produce 10,000 of these tables and they are in the market, that means that 10,000 tables for, let's say, 20 years are going to emanate uh, toxic chemicals that we are going to breathe. And the role of the designer is to start reflecting on this in an eco design and circular principle as to how am I going to reduce these toxic chemicals, have more natural sub, uh, substitutes or uh, biodegradable chemicals, and how am I also going to produce this table in a way that at the end of the life of this table, it can simply be disassembled and the different pieces of it, let's say metal or plastic, can be reused by another industry. So there is a lot of work to be done from the design aspect. And this is what we call design for disassembly, to be able to disassemble, because the more you glue things together and melt them together, the less likely you will be able afterwards to recycle things and reuse them. So the question is like, in the middle of the crisis, do you see that this is the opportunity for us to really build uh, from scratch a new a kind of a new mindset or a new society with new behaviors, not a new society, let's say, a society with new behaviors that appreciates like these new concepts that are coming to us because it will give us better chance for the future. So how do you see that? Uh, definitely, I feel that the younger generation is more aware nowadays and all the problems that we have related to climate change and pollution are raising awareness. Uh, however, we will not get there without the role of policies and regulations and industries and companies starting to do things differently. The good, the good news is that in Lebanon, we are being influenced also by, especially by Europe and the Arab world, but Europe has moved, is moving significantly in the direction of a circular economy. That means that today they are putting strong and strict regulations, for instance, to stop uh, disposable plastic. Disposable plastic, and especially in restaurants, cutlery, deliveries, is being abolished uh, all across Europe. That means that we need to find new materials that will substitute this disposable plastic. And that also means that things like agricultural waste, for instance, a biomaterial, let's say uh, uh, straw waste, for instance, or wheat waste, could be reused to produce materials that make new plates or new cutlery mm -hmm. that are biodegradable. So there are opportunities even in Lebanon today to look at what type of waste we have, especially in agriculture, but also in other industries, and how we can repurpose this or use research development academia in order to create new, new models and new materials that are less harmful use, also less energy because not, they're not imported, less embodied energy and less transportation locally, and eventually even create products that are strong enough to be exported, to cater to this European market, for instance. 
what are the economic implications of a circular economy in Lebanon? Like what opportunities will it have uh, on the industries, as you said, new product, products maybe, on job uh, uh, creation? Uh, so anything that would make money off of this idea of becoming a circular economy nation? We have been, due to the economic crisis, we have been moving slowly to a model of a circular economy in many aspects. Uh, for instance, when I was talking about second hand, wearing second hand, more and more people are now uh, actually enthusiastic about the idea of wearing vintage second hand clothes because of affordability. And this is becoming a trend. So the two together make it more likely that people go to actually thrift shops and exchange. Same thing now, we have more and more uh, opportunities for repair and sharing. I can give the example of um, a new um, company called Ajirni that is offering uh, online a lot of different items that you can just rent mm -hmm. instead of purchase. So this is creating economic incentives because Ajirni is making money out of this, but also for the people, it's making things more affordable. They don't need it on a yearly or on a daily basis, so they just rent it when they need it. You could even rent, you know, uh, apparently a truck if you need it for one day for a farmer. You could rent uh, renewable energy, a solar system for a month for harvesting season. There are many new models, business models that we call circular business models that are popping up and creating new economic opportunities. One example that comes to mind now is a renewable energy uh, supplier uh, in Lebanon who is supplying seasonally to farmers because they cannot rent this equipment all year long, but by having you know monthly subscriptions mm. when needed during the season that they need to harvest, they get electricity more, in a more reliable way. So it brings affordability and at the same time it reduces energy consumption, more cleaner energies and new jobs are being created. So, Lohi, to give you another example of the sharing economy and what's happening also in Lebanon, there is now a company called Wave, uh, which uh, leases e-bikes. So it's a subscription model on a monthly basis. You rent an e-bike, an electric bike, and the idea is to allow for people to use this electric bike to go to work instead of having their own cars. So this is wonderful. Did you hear about of it? Of course I know about it. And I know that this is part of the CIDRO project that, and it's a project that was endorsed by them in the scaling up uh, activities that they had to, to really push people to, uh, to use less of their cars, etc., and to move on. So definitely, I think it's a good idea. But again, when we talk about electric vehicles, electric bikes, all of that, uh, it's a bit weird, but it's, it's encouraging at the same time. Weird in the sense that if, when you don't have electricity in your houses, and what you have, you're using your bike and car. But again, great initiatives, I think, because this is the way forward for everyone. Absolutely. Uh, of course, it's always better to cycle with a, without an electric bike. It's also you know, a different way, a different uh, way of commuting. But the idea of the electric bike is that you are getting support to go longer distances or if you're going uphill and downhill and to go to work without sweating and, you know, in a, in a more, in an easier environment, which would incentivize people to consider not using their own private car and switch to an electric bike. Now, charging an electric bike is definitely much less energy consumption than charging an electric car or even using fuel for a proper car. And if you go to their website, they tell you how much CO2 emissions are being avoided by their clients because they are cycling using e-bikes compared to using a private car. But what I want to mention here that's also very important in the context of a circular economy is that WAVE on purpose adopted a model of leasing, so renting the electric bikes instead of selling electric bikes because of this idea that they keep the uh, ownership of the bikes and thus they can maintain them and repair exactly. them and keep them the longest possible on the market at the highest standard possible, which goes hand in hand with the concept of a circular economy where we want things to last, to really last in time and not go to waste. 
Typically, with bikes, people purchase them. They are very enthusiastic about them. They use them for a short period of time. I mean, not everybody, but yeah. some people. And then they end up in a garage or on the street. They rust and they go to waste and they are very valuable. So adopting a model of leasing uh, is also another way to, to, for our society to move towards a circular economy because also the manufacturer has the responsibility to maintain and to take back at the end and to disassemble and even to design in a way where you can disassemble so that every single piece of this bike can actually be reused later on. So, yeah. So, uh, great. And I guess, like, the, the effect of that is, like, if there are more demand for bicycles or for e-bikes or, uh, and then you have or more people using them, so then you will have to push the government or municipalities to have better roads, right? Absolutely. Because everything that you're saying now about these initiatives are very inspiring. And so we have to think of, okay, we have a, a problem today or crisis, but this is led, leading to good things that are happening. So let's keep on pushing to get to where we want, even if it's like a absolutely, small scale absolutely. push or whatever. Brings, like, yeah. But we, 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 let's, let's put it in that way, that these things will help us to get to, the, uh, to, uh, to other places that we want to get to. Yeah, yeah, which brings me to the role of grassroots initiatives and building communities and moving towards a model of a circular economy. Yes, we need regulations and laws, but we also need people, individuals to come together and to start lobbying for having, for example, bicycle uh, uh, paths and yeah. lanes, exactly, to have uh, safer ways to commute in, in the city for pedestrians also. So, so the more people start endorsing this and seeing the economic advantage because it's more affordable, but also the practicality and the potential, the more we will be able to also convince, uh, hopefully, <laughs> municipalities and governments to move in another direction. Yes. That's the spirit, I guess. Absolutely. And I wanted to mention some important, uh, a few important things related to the role of green entrepreneurship and startups, especially in, in the country in Lebanon. This is happening more and more. Uh, why? First, we are receiving a lot of funding, in particular from the EU, to accelerate the transition towards a circular economy and in particular in the, for the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. So Lebanon is part of the a consortium of countries uh, receiving funding for the Mediterranean to transition to circular economy, cleaner technologies, uh, less polluting technologies. So I know that the EU, you mentioned Cidro, but the EU is investing currently 3.7 million euros in order to work closely with about partnering with about 50 food and beverage companies in Lebanon, existing small and medium enterprises, to see how we can revalorize their agricultural waste or the waste of their production process in order to uh, create um, new products or new ways of doing things that also are aligned with a model of a circular economy. There are in a few new companies established in Lebanon and growing uh, doing this type of thing. So uh, one of them that I particularly like is Savvy Element. Uh, Savvy Element, uh, she's uh, the founder, Batul is a green chemist, and she is now producing cleaning products, so detergents, yeah. that are biodegradable, healthy, non-allergic, non-toxic for us, because most people don't know that these things that we clean with every day are actually very harmful for our health. So she's doing this, and she also has uh, cosmetics that are also uh, green, eco-friendly, but what's even more than the, the ingredients themselves, uh, she has a refill model, whereby if you subscribe to the refill model, the detergents come in big gallons, and when you finish, they are being refilled and cleaned and recirculated. And it is cheaper when you refill because there's no, there isn't the cost of the gallon. Another example is that we're going also in some places to shops that are selling in bulk. So meaning you don't have the container, uh, let's say the detergent container or the container of the um, uh, chickpeas or whatever. You bring the container with you and you fill in and it is weight and you pay by weight. And this is very successful because people are only paying for what they are purchasing and not the price of the container that is usually f about 40% of the total cost of the product. So it's bringing affordability and it is definitely energy reduction, 
we don't need all of this plastic that is thrown and used only once and uh, environmental pollution is reduced and waste is reduced. So just like to move on from that to talk about agriculture because you, you talked about peas etc. So uh, agriculture, how is circular economy working on agriculture or how is it impacted if you can tell us more about that? Agriculture is very important in the model of a circular economy, and one of the principles of a circular economy is what is called regenerate natural systems, meaning that everything that is organic waste, so coming from nature, renewable nature, so we're talking here plants, shrubs, uh, trees, uh, anything that is organic and that grows in nature, its waste should be revalorized into something else instead of going to waste or being burned because sometimes farmers just burn their agricultural waste, which is even worse. So in a model of a circular economy, our food waste, there are two main sources, let's say, of organic waste, the food waste and the agricultural waste. The food waste should be collected and composted. And here we have many companies in Lebanon now doing this at very high quality. Uh, they are even creating new liquid fertilizers, uh, compost that are high in nutrients that are being reused by farmers. And this has been uh, actually essential today in the, in the current food crisis and economic crisis in the country because it has allowed farmers to substitute part of their synthetic fertilizers, which they spray and they overuse, um, to reduce it by using something local that is cheaper than imported synthetic fertilizers. Mm -hmm. So we're reducing energy consumption, we're reducing uh, toxicity for the soil, soil is eroded less, and we are creating a lot of new green jobs in composting. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect that I mentioned, which is agricultural waste could become a type of new biomaterial that can be used and is biodegradable. We have, for instance, startups now looking into orange peels to be used to produce cleaning products or orange peels and garlic peels to be used for boards for the construction industry. So uh, compressing them and with other types of agricultural yeah. waste. And, and these, uh, these people are really working hard now in research and development to figure out solutions that will be put on the market. The last thing, which is related closely to energy, is that agricultural waste, some of it, can actually produce biofuel. So you could have methane extraction. We have a company producing fertilizers that is actually 100% sufficient in terms of uh, energy using solar, using solar water heating, and the rest, all of its heating comes from uh, agricultural waste. The part that they are not using for their fertilizer is being extracted as methane to heat their premises. One other aspect as well that we touch based on what you want maybe to talk more about like the buildings as well. So we see the applications. Yes, uh, I wanted to mention something very important, which is also in the concept of circularity and reusing uh, houses and buildings which are abandoned and are not being used or the ones which are being purchased just for uh, basically investments by expats and other people. This is a big stock on the market that is available that can provide affordable, eventually affordable housing for people while using much less energy to provide housing. Because it, you consume much less energy to refurbish a house than to actually build a new, a new house. And this is where you need regulation. This can only be solved through regulations. We need taxes on abandoned uh, houses and properties that are being reinvested into helping people refurbish or in refurbishments. There are different mechanisms. I'm not going to talk about them, but it's super important in a vision for Lebanon to move towards a circular economy to find ways for these houses and buildings to be re renovated. And that also means that we will have a greener Lebanon because you're, you know, building less, much, much less. So Maya, let's imagine that Lebanon is moving into or uh, is moving tomorrow to transition to a circular economy, what would Lebanon look like? So give me more hope and give me more inspiration. Okay, I would imagine a Lebanon that is definitely greener because we would need less construction, a Lebanon that is less polluting and less health hazards because we are facing a huge health crisis also 
given all these you know, toxic generators to produce our electricity. So anything we can do to reduce energy consumption and to complement it with renewable energy will help us actually live in a healthier way. We have to really remember that that's the way I see it. And uh, of course, we can talk much more <laughs> about it, but just to conclude. So the key <laughs> word here is sharing. Yes. So if you like this episode, please share it with others and spread the news. Energy Espresso Season 2 is great. وراح نقول هلا للعرب يقول شكرا لمايا كركور شكرا كثير على هالحلقه الكثير حلوه وشكرا لكل اللي تابعونا لهلا ضلكم معنا تابعونا والى اللقاء بحلقه جديده من Energy Espresso بسيزون 2